Okay, uh, thank you so much everyone for making it and I'd uh, like to welcome you officially to another RMI TED webinar. Now, primary animal health care, it's a good management practice since it's a first line of defense. So it is important for farmers, for stakeholders to understand that early disease identification, it is important for us to be able to run a profitable uh, enterprise and also be able to be sustainable in the red meat industry. So I am Mashlone Komocho, a red meat transformation facilitator at RMI Tech, and today I'm joined by Dr. Didi Klassen from Afrovet, who is an expert in uh, livestock diseases as she's a veterinary and also qualified a, 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 a technician in this field. So uh, Dr. Didi, you're welcome and we'd like to uh, give you this opportunity for you to interact with our farmers and stakeholders at large. Welcome Dr. Didi. Thanks Ms. Shaloni. Um, it's really a privilege to chat to everyone. Um, I am since we've had lockdown and um, the whole COVID story, we had to get used to webinars, but I still prefer seeing people and their faces. So um, webinars are a bit more challenging, but I want you guys to take part. I know um, Teams has the option of um, sort of uh, throwing thumbs ups and um, uh, there's different options to react. So if you can engage with me in that platform and then we can ask questions at the end. I'd really appreciate it because otherwise I'm just going to sit here and talk to myself for an hour, <laughs> uh, which is not the idea for today. At least I can see um, your face here in the corner, so that will help. But yeah, so and the idea for today is basically early disease identification and why that would be important. And um, it's something that we neglect. And I, I think we see it across the board. People um, don't know what to look for. And then we neglect the disease until it gets to a point where not even miracles will get the animal through. So what we plan to cover today is what you can do as a livestock farmer on a daily basis to help early to help perform early disease identification. And in essence, um, have a more profitable farming entity where you don't lose animals to diseases that you could have pre prevented. So let's fall in. I just want to um, see why my computers are moving. Um, I just before we start, want to give a big shout out to Matthew Carter and Dr. Donnie Widendell. Um, they did a lot of the, the work at the back end of this, the development of the disease identification charts um, with AfriVet training services. Um, so the credit is due to them and luckily I can make use of it today to um, help farmers. And if you want more information on this, the contact details for AfriVet at the end um, to have access to this information and they can get you into contact with us if you're interested in exploring this. Okay, so let's start. The first question is why are we farming? I think um, it's so part of our, our South African culture to be farmers um, regardless of your background. Um, we all either know a farmer or have family who has farmed. Um, so we have farming as part of our culture, but why? Why are we farming? And I think the first answer is basically to have livestock. So you want to use and you want them to have um, lambs or you have cows, you want them to have calves so that you can um, increase your production, whether it's in milk or in, um, in meat, you want more <laughs> animals. And then this is not why we're farming. You don't want to see dead animals. Look at all these. Um, I just want to see if I have a pointer. Otherwise, you guys are not going to see what I'm showing. So this is not this is not what we want. Um, I don't think anyone says, yes, I want to farm so that I can lose animals. But then ultimately, we want to make money um, because otherwise it's not profitable. Even if you don't sell your animals, your animals are assets and they are worth something. So um, this is why we're in farming. We love our animals, but then we also want to make a living. So um, early identi disease identification and treatment protocols. I just want to minimize this quickly. There we go. Now it's hidden again. So here's some questions I want you guys to take note of. And you can answer them to yourselves, um, but these are questions that we need to have answered when we're informing. So, um, and with particularly with um, regards to diseases. So, how are diseases identified on your farm? Who makes these diagnoses? Who sees if animals are sick? Um, what do you do to make 
these identifications of disease? Do you have a plan in place or do you just notice something is off and then you see what's going to happen? Or um, what is your protocol? So how are diseases identified on your farm? The second question is, um, how do you keep records of the signs um, of whether they're healthy or if they are sick? Do you have a record keeping system? So let's say um, we, obviously you have ranges of um, sizes of farmers from small scale to more commercial farmers where people can have anything from five animals to let's say 20,000 animals. I don't know, it can range quite broadly, but what records are you keeping? Whether you have um, two animals or 20,000 animals, you need an effective record keeping system so that you know, listen, cow number two is repetitively sick. Something is wrong because I keep on having to treat her for diseases, but you won't know if you don't keep a record. So record keeping is important and how are you doing it? And how are you keeping it? And are you going back on your records? Um, we don't want to just keep records for the sake of keeping records. And then um, if diseases are um, seen, how are they communicated to you? So if you are the owner of the animals and you have herdsmen looking after or shepherds looking after your animals, um, how are they communicating diseases or the potential diseases to you? And then um, when you give treatment for a specific disease that you're suspecting, do you have a protocol for every disease? So if you have hot water in your area, do you have a protocol or a recipe that you can follow to treat, to firstly diagnose hot water and then to give the treatment? Or if you have red water or pneumonia or ticks or internal parasites like a wireworm um, or liver fluke, what do you do and do you have a protocol for the diseases in your area? And then the last question is, when and how do you consult your veterinarian? So a lot of the farmers who contact me at AfriVet will say, um, they have this and this problem, can I help them? And then I'll ask them, but who is your veterinarian? Um, and a lot of the farmers say they don't know, they don't know of a vet in the area. So even if that's the only thing you learn from today is go and find out who's the veterinarian in your area. You get different types of vets, so you get the um, two government veterinarians, so they're employed by government, and there's two types of them. There's the state veterinarian who's there for disease control, and then you get the um, CCS veterinarians. They do community service, and a lot of them are involved in primary animal health care, so they can um, provide some services to a point. Um, to help you with primary animal health care in your herd, help you develop um, herd health programs and give advice in, in emergencies. And then you have private veterinarians. So those are vets that will um, give you a bowl at the end of the service and you have to pay for that. So those services are not government funded. Um, but um, the problem we have uh, when we think about veterinarians is most farmers will sort of see something is wrong and then try to treat it with different things that they buy and they don't, they only consult the veterinarian when the animal is down and busy dying. So by the time that um, the vet gets to that animal, it's expensive to get the vet there. They have to give medicine, medicine that's expensive and then they can't save the animal because it's basically dead. So then we think, oh no, veterinarians are expensive and they can't help us. But we shouldn't be calling the vet when the animals are busy dying. We should be calling them when they start to look sick. And even better is if you have a herd health veterinarian who walks the road with you, they see you once a month, once every three months, and they just make sure that your farming um, enterprises has a herd health program and um, and the different um, sort of livestock veterinarians have what? different packages that they use. So you have vets who get, have packages or, um, where they um, basically um, will say, if you have this package with us, you can have two visits a year and two emergency visits, and then they ask you a certain amount. So there are options that you can consult or, op or, or consider, but just make sure that you have a veterinarian that you can phone when you suspect disease on the farm. Okay, so let's start. Um, there are two types of diseases that we have to consider when we look at disease identification. The first group of diseases are diseases that are better to um, prevent. So you can't really treat those diseases, like for example, brucellosis here at the bottom. It's a disease that you'd rather prevent exposure because it's illegal in South Africa to treat brucellosis and you can't really treat it. So the best thing in that case would be to prevent the disease. 
The same with lumpy skin and black water. These are diseases that if your animals have it, it's quite complicated to treat. So you'd rather um, vaccinate them so that you prevent the disease from happening at all. Um, with tuberculosis, you prevent exposure by um, proper biosecurity. Um, and then obviously there are diseases that you can't prevent. So you can't get rid of all the ticks, but you can treat the animals when they have ticks on them, or you can treat them when they have um, internal parasites. Or if you see that there's nutritional issues, you can treat it, but it's very difficult to prevent those diseases. So you can't prevent a drought, but you can treat it by providing additional food and supplements. So um, there are some shortcuts here. And um, what I'll do is I'll um, provide access to this information. And this is what you can also get from AfriVet. If you contact us, we will make this information available. And you're also welcome to take screenshots if you want. Um, I know people are usually frantically taking screenshots um, when we do lectures. So you're welcome to just make a copy of this um, for your own use. So um, that the first part of disease prevention is to increase the general resistance. So you do that by um, giving them um, nutritional supplements, like we are taking our vitamins and minerals in the morning so that our immune systems are supported, that we don't get as sick or as readily sick. So you can do the same with your animals and give them um, nutritional support. Then if you want to, also another way to do general resistance or increase the general disease resistance is by treating parasites. So if you have internal parasites like wireworm affecting your sheep, they will be more prone to diseases because their immune systems are suppressed. So you want to increase their general resistance um, by taking away things that will uh, make them more susceptible to disease. And you also want to give them supplements. Then um, to increase specific resistance. So this is resistance specific to a specific disease is by vaccination. So we know we can vaccinate for all the clostridial diseases. You can vaccinate for lumpy skin, brucella, um, there's even a, a vaccine for wireworm now. So there are specific vaccinations we can give to prevent diseases. Then we can decrease exposure. An example of this is for a blue tongue, which is a vector-borne disease. So if you treat the um, or protect the animals against mosquitoes, you protect them against blue tongue indirectly. And then prevent exposure is, for example, if you um, don't let your animals come into contact with sick animals at all. So this would be brucellosis, tuberculosis. You have a very accurate or effective biosecurity measures. Okay, so this is two important things. You have different diseases. There are diseases that if they there, there's not much you can do. So we'd rather prevent them. And on the other side, we have diseases that we can't prevent. So we'll treat those. And those are the ones we're going to focus on today. Okay. So the first thing of, um, that's important with early disease identification is daily observations. You need to be with your animals daily. If you can't be with them, you need to um, have someone that can go look at them every day. We can't just see our animals on the weekend and expect them to thrive. We need to look at them daily. And it's critical because, um, and then to say, listen, I've been with them every day. They were fine. And then suddenly today, they're not okay. And we'll go into more detail as to what you need to look at a little bit later, but just know you need to look at them daily. Then um, you need to have a structured approach. Um, these are the things I'm going to go into more detail in a little bit, but you need to have a system that works for you. If you want to start at the head and end at the tail, do that every day. Or if you want to start at the back end because it's easier for you and then go towards the front, when you systematically go through the animals in the daily um, uh, examinations or observations, um, it's important that you have a system and you know that you're looking at everything. Because if we sort of jump around today, you're looking at the head first and tomorrow you start with the hind foot, you will miss things because we're human. So if you have a system, um, that really, really helps to keep you on track. And you can also get access to this um, from AfriVet. So just let us know. Um, so if, yes, I'm hearing someone in the background. Okay, I'm going to continue. Just shout if you want to say something. I can't see anyone. Um, so the first question, um, apart from observation, is what is normal? If you don't know what normal is, you're not going to know what abnormal is. And um, to know what normal is, you need to spend time with healthy animals. And your veterinarian can also help you. Your animal health technician is also a, a remarkable source of information. So find out what is normal. 
they say what they do with people in banks to realize what fake money is like. They make them count regular uh, legal money the whole time. Notes after notes after notes for days, for weeks, for months. And then suddenly they slip in fake money or counterfeit money. And then you'll pick it up because your hands, your body knows what normal is. So if you know what normal is, abnormal will stand out very quickly. So spend time with your animals that you know what's normal, um, that abnormal will stand out. The next thing we need to keep in mind is that diseases run a process. So if you think about yourself, um, most of us would have had a cold or the flu before. Um, and it has a process. So usually the cold starts with a runny nose and then your throat starts tickling, then you start yeah. coughing, then you get a fever and eventually you get bronchitis, your voice disappears, laryngitis, bronchitis, and then you get pneumonia. And if somewhere along this line, no one intervenes, you can potentially die. So at any point in time, if you, we all think of pneumonia as um, sort of a specific image, but pneumonia starts with other symptoms. It doesn't start with a coughing, dying animal. So at any point in time, you can um, sort of see this animal. It doesn't have to be the end stages. With what or two, we think of an animal that's neurological. And if you do the post-mortem, there might be fluid around the, in the pericardium in that sac around the heart. Um, and you won't always see that with all hot water cases. Sometimes they die so quickly that there wasn't time for those symptoms to um, develop. So just bear in mind when we work with diseases, especially if you're going to look at your animals every day, you're going to see the diseases at the beginning. You're not necessarily going to see the end. And don't wait for the end because then it's too late. So um, there are signs of health that I said the normal side we need to know. And then there are signs of disease. With injury, um, it's very easy to see because the animals will be hurt. They would have broken a leg. It's, um, it's a very short process. Um, it doesn't take months or years to have an injury, um, but they also um, easier to prevent. So with injuries, it's better to prevent injuries than to try and treat them, um, but it will have a short process. Poisonings, depending on the poison that is used, um, will also be quite quick, but you get poisons like um, the people who live in areas with kousikte. Um, the name in Afrikaans means quick disease, but there's nothing quick about the disease development process. So it's usually animals that have consumed the food a long time ago or the plant, and then they develop heart problems. So they'll drop dead suddenly, but the disease process was quite long. Whereas with other poisonings like um, it's very quick, or top poisoning, um, it's very quick. So those also rather prevent and not have them have access to these toxic plants or um, heavy metals, etc., depending on what the poison is. But also a short disease process, but rather prevent it than try and treat it. Then infections can be a, take a bit longer. So if you just think about yourself and the flu or of a, a stomach bug, it takes a bit of time. You might eat something funny or you get exposed to this virus. And then it takes a few days before you start showing symptoms. And then several, um, it can take quite a long time before you die. Um, so infections also um, takes a bit longer to develop, but they are more treatable. Then um, parasites also will take longer to show symptoms um, because the parasites will have to do more damage to the animals before they show symptoms. But the other problem is with parasites is that um, some of them like wireworm, those of you who've had very bad wireworm cases will know that severe wireworm infestation can kill sheep within two days. So they'll look fine today and tomorrow they just drop dead. They didn't show any signs of sickness. So parasites are a bit of the exception to the rule. They can um, take a long time to show symptoms or they can kill your animals quite quickly, but you want to monitor that continually. And then the last one that can take the longest to show showing symptoms is nutrition. So obviously the animal will have to lose weight over a period of time before you will have them die of nutritional deficits. So just keep this in mind when you're assessing your animals for different problems. They might start to look sick now, but they have been getting sick for a long time if it's nutritional. Okay, and the other side of this is animals will, um, if especially with infection, they could be sick and their bodies are trying to heal again. So you might have a sick animal busy healing, so the symptoms can look a bit different again. 
And if all of this seems very complicated, this is why you have your veterinarian and your animal health technician on your side to help you work through this process and uh, develop a system for you to um, uh, guide you through making di disease diagnoses. Then, this is also important, is history or the background information when you have a case. Um, what type of animal? So if you're going to phone a veterinarian or an animal health technician um, to get advice, this information is crucial. Um, what is the type of animal? There are diseases that sheep get that cows don't get and vice versa. So the type of animal, what's the breed of the animal? Certain breeds are more susceptible to diseases than others. Um, the sex of the animal, males can get diseases, females can't and vice versa. Um, the age of the animals, there are diseases that are more common in younger animals versus older animals, for example. And then uh, the number of animals affected, you'll see here it says number of animals affected and number of animals in the group. Why this is important, if you lose one animal and you only have 10 animals, that is severe. If you lose 10 animals and you have 10,000 animals, that is still a small number and could actually be normal for that number of animals. So it's important when you find your veterinarian and animal health technicians to say to them, listen, um, I have 100 pigs and 98 of them died overnight. That is crucial information because if I hear that, the first thing I'm going to think of is African swine fever, and that's a very serious disease and we need to react quite quickly. So tell us as much information as you can. So when we ask you how many animals are on the group, we're not trying to spy for south or tax purposes. We want to make diagnostic um, uh, decisions because if you, um, the percentage of animals affected can also give us an idea of what disease could potentially be involved. Um, stage of production, is the animal pregnant or they busy in breeding season? This could also give rise to different diseases. Vaccination history is quite important. Um, for example, if you did vaccinate for, against clostridial diseases, it minimizes the risk for clostridial diseases. It doesn't mean it might not be that, but it could. Um, it makes it less likely that it was a clostridial disease. And then any environmental changes. Um, I'm sitting um, in the Titsikama at this moment. I arrived this morning and I left a very warm Pretoria and um, and it's sort of raining and overcast and the wind is blowing here in um, in um, the Eastern Cape. So it's important to know what the different environmental changes are. So if I get a cold now, <laughs> it could just be from environmental changes suddenly going from 34 degrees to 20 degrees. And then um, any recent management actions taken, this means that you recently dock their tails um, did you castrate them? Uh, was there being warning involved? Did you take them um, to the crawl to get dipped? Um, were they dewormed? So these things can all play a role in stress, etc. So it's important things that you need to mention to the person who's going to help you. Um, so let's start with the good stuff. You guys um, saw this um, image earlier. So this is a, a guide that AfriVet Training Services developed to assist the farmers to look at everything. So it helps you to not forget certain things. So when you start um, in the morning doing your observations of the animal, so you look at their face. I would always, I usually start at the head. So you look at the face, you examine the eyes, the mouth, the nose, the ears, and you see if they're alert. So if I sat here this morning and I was doing presentations and I was just sort of droopy and depressed, you'll know something is wrong with me. But you can see I'm bright, I'm alert, there's no snot running from my nose or pus coming from my eyes, so we assume <laughs> I'm okay. Then the next thing you need to look at is breathing. Um, how's the animal breathing? Is it <laughs> increased rapid breathing? Is it sort of slow? Um, are they still eating? When they're eating, are they chewing properly? Are they, um, if they are ruminants, are they ruminating, sort of bringing up the cud and chewing it again? Can they swallow? Are they drinking water? If they're drinking water, are they probably properly swallowing it or is the um, water just running out again? Um, the next thing you can look at is then the condition of the animal. Um, I'll show you a photo on the next slide of how you can assess. Um, is it too thin? Is it too fat? So we want the ideal body condition. Um, then you want to see the rumen full. So at the back end here, just behind the ribcage, there's a triangle, which we call the um, ruminal groove. That should be distended. It shouldn't be sunken in. So the moment it's sunken in, you know the rumen is not doing what it's supposed to do. 
And if a room and its room and isn't working, it's it's sick. There's something massively wrong with it. So you need to do something quickly. We can also look at the skin. Is the coat dull? Is the um, are there any lacerations or the abscesses? So just have a look at that um, ticks, etc., um, on the body um, affecting the skin. Then we move to the back of the animal and we look at the urine color and urine should be yellow so any um or sort of a straw color so any other color variations like a dark yellow or red or brown is not okay and you should investigate that further um what does the feces look like the dung if it's a dairy animal we want it to be loose stool but if you saw that loose stool with an extensive beef animal you'd be concerned because that means there's diarrhea and if it's very constipated, it could indicate diseases like anaplasmosis or gall sickness. So the dung can tell you a lot about the animal's health. Then um, if we look at the vulva or the sheath and um, see if there's any damage there or the ticks there, um, what does the membranes look like? Is there any color discolorations? Look under the tail for ticks. Look at the tail itself um, to see if it's sort of paralyzed. Can they move the tail? And then always remember the other and the testes. We also look at those to make sure that if the, it's a cow with a calf at foot, you want the other to be able to nourish that calf. So examine the other and see if she doesn't have mastitis or if it's full of milk or not. Then lastly, you can look at the side of the animal, see how it's standing. Does it look in pain? Is it favoring a specific leg? Is it just lying down? And like I said, is the tail flaccid just hanging there? Um, with no movement. All of these things, if you mark this, you can have a lot more information that you can give your veterinarian over the phone and they can assist you in um, determining what's wrong. So if you've done this and everything is fine, you go on and you do it again tomorrow. Then if you see something is wrong, then we start an examination. So with an examination, the most important thing and the first thing to do is to take the temperature because if an animal has a fever, it will give you an indication if it's an infectious disease or not. So then I'm talking hot water, red water, bacterial infections will all give you a fever. Um, and know that the normal for animals is usually 38.5 degrees, but there can be variation. If it's a very, very hot day like we have in Pretoria today, that's 34 degrees, and you have an animal that has a temperature of 39, 39.5, it can still be normal. But if I have an animal with 39 degrees here in um, Carriedo, where I'm at the moment, um, I would be concerned because it's overcast, it's cool, the wind is blowing. So you expect the 38.5. You don't expect uh, almost 40 degrees. Anything above 40 is abnormal. So then you know it's an infectious cause. Um, so make a note of that and you'll know if you find a veterinarian, the first thing we're going to ask you is, does the animal have a fever? If the animal is sick and doesn't have a fever, it's usually nutritional or it can be a poison um, because those don't usually elicit a fever. There are always exceptions to the rule, but it gives us an indication of what to look for. And um, this is what I showed you or told you about earlier about condition. So if you look at the spinous processes of the animals, um, this one is extremely skinny, almost anorexic. Um, a cachectic is the word we use for animals. So there's no body fat or muscles left. This animal is eating itself. This animal is quite fat. There's a bit of fat on top of that muscle as well. So ideally, we want animals to be between 2.5, 3.5, because then they conceive better. Um, they don't eat all your food. They're not expensive to maintain. I know everyone wants fat animals, but fat animals don't always get pregnant as easily. So you want a fine balance with your body conditions. And then after you've done the temperature, you've looked at the condition with your examination, you have to look inside the eyelid. I'll show you a nice photo now, but know that you, you can't just look at the eye, you have to look at the conjunctiva. So pull the eyelid down, push on the eye that that third eyelid comes out. Um, look inside the ears, look inside the mouth, look for anything that can um, indicate why this animal is not feeling well. And then lymph nodes, you know, when you go to the doctor or the clinic, they're always pushing you here at the bottom of your throat. What they're doing is they're feeling for your lymph nodes to see if they're enlarged. And we can do the same. You have to sort of palpate, touch the animal and feel um, if there's any enlarged lymph nodes. Um, then we can look at the front legs, the back feet, look for ticks between the toes, look for laminitis, anything that you can see um, or lameness, anything that you can see that can indicate why this animal is not doing okay. And then lastly, this is the information that we discussed that the vet will want. 
And then um, also, what is the first signs of disease that you saw? Um, or when did you see the disease first? Because if the animals start looking sick on Monday and they only start dying by Friday, it will also give us an indication of um, different diseases that can take different times. A heart attack will kill you immediately, whereas the flu will take a bit longer. Um, so this is important to know for the person trying to help you make a diagnosis. Okay, this is what I told you about how to look at the eye. This is just looking at the eye. Someone is pulling the eyelid down here. This animal is extremely anemic. But if you look at it, an animal's eye like this, you can confuse this part with this part and you'll think all your animals are anemic. So the best thing is pull the eyelid down, push on the eye that you can see this. It should be a nice coral pink. Um, those of you that know the thermometer chart, it will just help you know if your animals are anemic and need dosing or not. And there's just the palpation. So then you just say this, the temperature was fine. The eyelids are, um, let's say in this case, very um, pale. So the animal has lost a lot of blood. So we need to dose. Um, at this stage, when an animal is this anemic, um, you might struggle to pull them through, but it's worth a try. Okay. I hope everyone is still with me and awake. I have no idea to see um, what's happening. Um, but just shout um, if anyone has questions or inputs. So now we're going to go to parasite management and monitoring because part of your disease diagnosis is to look at your parasites and your parasite load. Blue ticks is the biggest worry because they carry diseases like red water and anaplasmosis. So you want to um, make sure that you control your, your, especially your blue tick levels and when you treat them you can make a difference in the load. Um, I know people always sort of get bored when we discuss life cycles and how ticks work. And if you say one host, two host, three host tick, people are like, oh, no, she's going to go on about life cycles again. I'm not going to discuss those today, but please go learn about what is the difference between a one host tick, a two host tick and a three host tick, because it will help you to find out where to look for the animals. Your one host ticks, like your blue ticks, usually... Um, have a different distribution to your three host ticks because they had a longer time to sit on the on the cow. They only have the cow as a host, so they will hatch from the egg, and the nymphs and the larvae will be on the on the cow and the adults. Everyone lives on the cow, so there's time to distribute across the animal. Whereas the three host ticks, um, like the hot water tick, only the adult gets onto the animal, so they usually sit on the underside. They don't have time to move. Um, across the animal like the one host ticks does. So that helps. So make sure that you know your life cycles and what the different ticks look like and where they are. Um, so this is what we mean by limiting the population. If you're in a summer rainfall area, you will have a peak in the tick population um, just after the first rains. And then all these, if one is the first generation after the first rains, and then they will have babies, will have babies, will have babies. So usually, yeah, by April, we have the fifth generation of ticks coming through. So the least ticks we have who can have grandchildren and great-grandchildren um, in uh, after the first rains, the less we will have in May, April. So the idea is to um, dip or... Um, use pour on um, on your animals in just after the first rains so that you kill off. So this green boom doesn't happen. You sit here on the red line, your tick numbers are staying low. So they don't have chance to do this sort of exponential growth. And then just to make sure that you have less eggs that go through the winter, you will dip them again um, strategically at the end of autumn. So this is the minimum that you can do for blue ticks. So dip them after the first rains and then dip them again in August. In some areas of the country, the tick burden is so intense that they have to dip weekly, especially with the multi-host ticks. So this is why it's important to develop the strategy with your veterinarian that they make develop a program with you or with your animal health technician that you can strategically um, try and control all types of um, ticks, not just the one host ticks like the blue tick, but also your three host ticks. But this is specifically then um, for the blue ticks. Um, this is just a photo of when you're going to do weekly tick inspections. So daily animal health observations and then weekly we look at the ticks. You have to look inside the ears, yeah, on the brisket, the neck or the sort of the chest area. 
looking around the other, your three host texts, like your high llama, um, oh, yeah, and llama texts like to sit here, yeah, your bone texts, um, yeah, under the tail, they like to sit on the legs and then the feet. So you have to look in all these areas to know if you have a tick problem. And then know the different ticks that occur in your area. If there's not hot water in your area, you won't have the bone tick. But you, a lot of the dry areas have the bone legged tick. So it's a, a blackish tick with banded legs. The red legged tick um, is also quite common across South Africa. Blue tick, also very common. And then the brown ear tick, um, if you have it, you have to treat it because it can cause quite a lot of damage to your animals. So know the different common ticks in South Africa and what's in your area specifically that you can address it. Um, for the brown ear ticks, you can um, use a tick grease, for example, then you don't have to dip the animals the whole time. So um, this is definitely part of your early disease detection is to know what ticks you have and where they are and to deal with them. The next question is what about um, internal parasites? It's important to know which ones you have. I know everyone always thinks everything is um, wireworm and um, they just want to treat for that or everything is liver fluke, but you can't make that call and you're going to cause um, resistance in those parasites to the drenches we use. So it's important to know what worms are we dealing with um, or flukes are we dealing with so that you um, can treat the right ones and um, not waste money on the wrong drugs, number one. Number two, not cause resistance in your area. And then um, the third part is just help your animals not get sick. So how we can do that is you can um, do fecal floats or sedimentations. Um, and then we see the eggs of the different, air, of, of the different internal parasites. And then um, a lot of those roundworm eggs can look very similar. So then we advocate fecal culture. So uh, what that means is we take the um, eggs and we hatch them basically, and then we look at the larvae that come out and then we identify the worms based on that. So then we can know, okay, you have, you literally have a wire worm issue or you have a bankrupt worm issue, which of the lots of bankrupt worm issues you have, or you might have a um, esophagostum uh, nodular worm problem, or you could have a fluke problem. Which fluke? Is it liver fluke or is it conical fluke? Because they have different drugs that treat them. So it's really important that you know um, which organisms you're dealing with. Then fecal egg count reduction test is a test we do. So on the day you drench, you take fecal uh, material from a specific uh, group of animals. And then uh, seven to 10 days later, you take feces from those animals again. You take dung from them again. And then we compare, did your drench kill the worms that were present? So that's something you can do to monitor that you don't develop resistance in the flock. And then the last thing you can do, especially for internal parasites, is post-mortem examinations. Um, even at slaughter, look if there are worms present in the sheaf or in the cattle that you're slaughtering, because that's the best way. Then you see and you visualize the internal parasites. And post-mortems are, are always a very good tool in general to make disease diagnosis. So whether it's pneumonia or torsions or injuries, it's important that you make use of post-mortems. And if you're slaughtering animals, just obviously you're not going to fiddle with meat too much, but make sure that you have a look to see if you don't have diseases or injuries or lesions that you can see. Um, so this is just an example of the disease process of liver fluke. So this is the liver of a normal animal. If you look at the um, bile ducts, they look they're nice and thin. The liver is not, not uh, sort of um, fibrosed. And the um, yeah, and yeah, you can see there's a fluke sitting there. It looks like a little snail. Um, and this is very far along. If you compare this one to that one, can you see how thick the um, the bile ducts have become? This is sort of chronic injury. And this liver you can't eat. There's some fibrosis there as well at the bottom. So this is not a good liver to have. And if you see this at post-mortem or when you sort to your animals, you know, listen, I have a liver fluke problem, so I need to deal with this. Or if you open the rumen and you see, yo, there's a bunch of adult conical flukes. Um, the co adult conical fluke is just laying eggs and um, sort of messing up your area with eggs and contaminating your area. But it's the immatures that cause problems. So we can't say, we are, it's the adults, we're not going to do anything about it. The eggs that they lay, um, are going to hatch and those immatures are going to infect via the um, 
sort of the life cycle is quite complicated, but eventually they have to move through the small intestine and that's where they cause the hemorrhage and the black tarry diarrhea. So know and look for these parasites when you're slaughtering animals or doing a post-mortem. Okay, then let's just take a breather. Um, on disease profiling and herd health programming. So um, AfriVet has developed a program that I'm gonna explain now. So um, I just quickly want to um, um, quiet the crowd around me. Sorry about that. So um, to have a disease in any area or any disease to happen, there are three components that need to be present. So the disease causing organism must be there. And if it's something like Rift Valley fever, you need the virus and you need mosquitoes in the area. So the disease needs to be there. The animals that this disease affects needs to be in the area. So if you have um, mosquitoes and the Rift Valley fever virus, but you don't have sheep or cattle that can propagate the disease in the area, the disease is not going to happen. And then the environmental conditions should be right. So we know um, the previous Rift Valley fever outbreak we had, there was massive rains in the area. So the environmental um, conditions were in such a way that it had the disease happen. And it's now been another 10, 12 years since the previous outbreak. We haven't had Rift Valley fever outbreaks um, in, to the scale we had because we just haven't had the correct three things aligned for this disease to occur. So this goes for any disease you dis deal with. The disease needs to be there, the host needs to be there, and the environment must be correct. That's why you see blue tongue in summer, because that's the environmental conditions are right for the disease to be there. And this is why we see um, lice and mites in winter, because the environmental conditions are correct or they're happy in those in conditions, so then they um, pop out. So these are the three things you need to keep in mind for your area. What diseases do we commonly see and when? So the disease profile looks at your year. So if you're in a summer rainfall area, you will have sort of this dull um, brown grass and the grass will go greener as we go into summer. Then going into autumn, the grass will die off again. Um, there are diseases in the summer rainfall areas that we'll see at different times. So yeah, they'll say lice and mites and more in the winter, pneumonia is more in the winter. And where your um, tick-borne diseases are more in summer, your worms who like the wetter season. Um, hi, everyone okay? Um, so the, um, yeah, so your tick diseases are more in the wetter regions your or times of the year. And then your worms also, because they need that rain. They just prefer it that way. But you'll see this is not perfect. There are diseases that are not mentioned here. So this is why we can't take this and just use it across the country. We need to develop this specifically for different areas because even some of our areas differ. So hot water, even though the Free State is a summer rainfall area, they don't have hot water. But in Limpopo and parts of the Eastern Cape, they do have hot water. So you need to adapt this for your area. But this is available if you need it. Um, and then generic herd health programs. So it's one of my frustrations. I, I sort of die a little bit on the inside whenever someone phones me and says, oh, doc, can't you just give me a generic herd health program? And it's almost like saying you want shoes. Um, there are so many different types of shoes. Um, there are so many different types of sizes of feet. Just saying you want a shoe, it's not gonna solve your problem. If you wear a size 11 and you wanna go running, and I give you a size five um, stiletto shoe. It's a shoe, but it's not gonna solve your problem or cater for your needs. So it's really important that we all understand that there is no such thing as a one size fit all generic herd health program for farming. It's a very bad idea to take your neighbor's um, herd health program and try and put it on your farm. So if you're a farmer in the free state and you take your friend in Limpopo's herd health program, it's going to say they vaccinate and block for hot water. You're going to waste money if you try and implement that. And you are not going to look out for um, specific diseases or toxic plants that are scored to your area. And you're not going to um, take the necessary um, sort of provision or make the necessary provision for the 
uh, the colder winter months where it goes minus seven in the free state and in um, Limpopo it doesn't. So please don't take a generic herd health program, rather find a vet or an animal health technician that can help you develop one for your area and preferably someone who's working in your area. So I'm sitting in Pretoria and I love to help people, but I know that I'm not going to help you to the best that you can be helped like the vet who's in your area. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So there are different types. This is one, um, just a generic herd health one where you look at when you should vaccinate for what. I know you guys are taking screenshots, but please don't just go and apply this and say, yes, Dr. Didi said do this and I will have no problems. I can guarantee you if you just do this, you will have problems. So go and find your veterinarian that they do something similar for you, for your whole herd, but then also for your heifers, which will look at how old they are. When are we going to vaccinate them for different things? Okay, so promise me that you will make contact with your veterinarian to help you. Okay, then the last thing, we're almost at the end, is something called biosecurity. And um, I know people sort of, again, after COVID and after the whole um, with the mouth disease, everyone is tired of biosecurity, but it's something we cannot get tired of. Like we know, crime in the cities are really bad, and I can't get tired of like locking my front door and parking my car behind the closed gate, because if I do that, my car is going to go missing and someone is going to break into my house. So just as we are um, hectic about our personal security, we need to be hectic about biosecurity. So what that means is... What that means That's cool. is that <laughs> um, can um, you guys meet that person? Sorry. Can you please? All right, we are good. Sorry, Sorry about that, Doc. Good. No worries, no worries. Um, so with biosecurity, and like I said, we're taking our personal security very serious. We have to do the same with biosecurity. And what that means is it's looking at organisms and diseases that can get onto your farms. The tragedy that we're seeing currently with the poultry industry is happening despite hectic efforts with biosecurity. So just imagine what would have happened if they didn't take biosecurity seriously. So biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity. So it's there's a lot of factors to biosecurity. I've sort of just typed the first thing that came to my mind, but this is something that your vet or your animal health technician can help you with as well. So you need to identify your animals. If you don't know who your animals are, who, who your animals are and who's your neighbors and they mix, um, let's say fence breaks, um, you need to know this is my animal, that's my neighbor's animal. And if they did mix, you need to quarantine them for a bit. Don't just put them with the rest of your animals. So identify your animals. It's a law in South Africa that your animals must be identified. Then um, know where you're buying your animals from. I know we go to um, auctions and we just, all these animals come together. We buy animals there and we take them home. So this is almost like a super spreader event with COVID. Everyone went to um, events where lots of people were and then they, we took COVID all across the country. The same thing happens with our animals. We take them to an auction, they get all kinds of weird pneumonia, viruses, brings it back, or you buy animals that weren't tested for brucellosis. Now you bring brucellosis, which is a horrible disease. It takes two years for the animals to start showing symptoms, and then your whole herd is affected by that stage. So um, make sure that you buy from reputable sources and try not to mingle your animals if you can't help it, Okay, unless you can't help it. Then access control. Don't let any person come into contact with your animals. They are bringing diseases. So I was in the Titikama today. Last week I was in Swartburg. You don't know what weird diseases I've picked up on the different farms I've been to. So when I get to your farm, make me put on clean shoes or disinfect my gum boots before I come close to your animals. And if you want to show off your, pr your pride and joy bull, um, your stud bull, don't show it to your family, show them photos because they are bringing diseases where they're coming from. Um, then vector control, um, try to treat the ticks and the um, other vectors like mosquitoes, try to do fly control because they bring diseases from the neighbor, neighbors or they can make your animals sick. 
internal parasites. If animals get onto your farm, make sure that you dip and dose them, that they can get rid of the um, parasites that they are bringing onto your farm. Where does your feed come in if you have to buy food, that you don't bring diseases with the food? Or if the water is running through a sewage plant, they can give a, cause a lot of diarrhea um, if the animal's water sources aren't clean. So that's part of biosecurity. Make sure your animals are vaccinated for diseases that you can't um, treat, like we said earlier. Disinfect areas for sick animals where don't lance abscesses without disinfecting the area. Like I've said a hundred times today, make sure you know a vet who you can phone and even your vet, like I said, you don't know where I was, make sure that I clean myself before I come onto your come come into contact with your animals. And then record keeping is so important because that's where you can see where the breaks in your biosecurity measures are or you need more work. And there is so much more to biosecurity than just this. But please, please, please don't neglect biosecurity as part of early disease detection because this is early disease prevention, never mind detection. And that's my story. There's our website and our contact details if you need more information. You're welcome to contact us. I'm just going to leave it here for a second and then I'll stop sharing my screen that I can see you. Okay, no, thank you so much, Dr. Didi. We highly appreciate the effort that you made in this awesome presentation. So I guess uh, they say uh, great wealth, great health comes with great wealth. So take care of your animals so it can take off your pockets. So yeah, we highly appreciate your effort and I can see that uh, there are hands that uh, people are interested in engaging with you. So are you looking forward to take yes. more? Yes, let's take questions. All right, perfect. Uh, Lesara Kometa, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and engage with our doctor. Uh, hello, everyone. I just wanted to find out first. Well, I think this one is directly to first to AfriVet directly. Do they have a record keeping a template that they can we can use? Or maybe we can download somewhere because every time I'm trying to find online, they are, they always sell them. So there's no one that has a template that is free that people can print and use it. And then now also now to Dr. Didi, I just want to find out mm. because uh, with biosecurity, it becomes a challenge when you are in. Are there any advice that you can use that are specific to people who are using communal land? Because whether you like your animals will mix with other animals, but how can you minimize diseases yeah, so in such instances? That's an awesome question. So I was a state vet in Smithfield um, a couple of years ago, now that I think about it quite a long time ago. But I loved our communal farmers in that area because they work together as a community. I'm not saying that it's one farm, but all the communal um, animal owners work together. And um, as the state vet in the town, they got me to um, test the animals every year for Brusella. We tested for TB if the um, tuberculin was available. Government has resource issues, but if it was available, we would test it. And I'm proud to say I know a lot of the commercial farmers um, would say that no, the um, communal farmers are the source of a lot of diseases that would break out like brucella. And I could say, mm -mm, look, we test the animals every year and they are clean. So I would say see yourselves as one entity that all of you work together. And I know people um, like to work as islands, but if you as a community can work together in communal um, grazing, it can work. And like the small farmers of Smithfield has shown, um, to me at least, that's my experience with them, was that it's possible to work together to make that biosecurity happen. So when you vaccinate, buy, you guys can buy together, then you save money on the vaccine. So if you're going to vaccinate for brucellosis, do it together. If you're going to vaccinate for um, clostridial diseases, do it together. Share that cost. Keep your records together because in that sense you um, are growing your, I want to say, your wealth and your business together. Um, but it is challenging on the common niches because obviously your animals have access to a lot more of the, um, uh, what do we call it, rubbish that people chuck out of their cars and they eat the plastic. So there are other issues that you guys have to deal with. Um, but I want to say do work together and um, sort of form a cooperative in the common edges because yeah, it can it can work. Um, and I was very proud to be the state vets of the Smithfield farmers because they worked hard and, and they were successful. Okay, 
And I guess that has clearly answered that collaborative farming is the way to go in a communal land. And uh, that's how we can uh, make sure that our animals are protected from diseases. Okay, uh, and regarding the, the record keeping, okay, from, from our side, I'm not sure about Afrovet, but from our side, we do have our record keeping books. I've received so many inquiries related to recording uh, keeping books. So we have the manual one where you have to uh, record individualized animals and that those animals in that case, they should be tagged with a specific number that is not the same as the, as the other ones. So that kind of a system is going to help you in order maybe you want to check the performance of each animal, such as the intercalving period and so forth. Then alternatively, we have the general book, whereby this is just a general head to just record to say, okay, today I vaccinated with, uh, let's say, lumpy skin vaccine, and then I vaccinated the entire head or just hay fast or so forth. So those information, we can also make it available to you electronically, and we have some printed copies that we can also share with you. Okay, uh, I guess uh, you were answered in that Delisera, so we give this opportunity to Simpiwe Sandlana. You can unmute yourself. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director, and uh, good morning. I also want to thank uh, the doctor for the awesome presentation. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. All right, thank you so much. I have a a heifer that has just calved. Uh, it started, uh, it started turning around like it's a malcopper. Only, okay. it will turn only to the left hand side. It will turn into circles, circles a couple of times and then goes, turn into circles a couple of times and then goes. We could not call it because it was pregnant. Now it has given, it has calved mm. a wonderful, wonderful, uh, Female, female, uh, 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 yeah. What could be the problem? Now, what can I do to save it? Okay, so um, that's interesting symptoms that she's showing. So, like I said, always whatever you do, go through the system. So go have a look at her eyes. Are they? You go through that system. You don't go. Oh no, she's turning in circles. You go from the beginning. You look at all the things I've showed you to look at, and then you make a list of things that look wrong. Um, does she have a fever? I know it's going to be a bit more complicated to get her temperature if she's not standing still. But for example, anaplasmosis, um, gall sickness can make them look like they have rabies. They can look really crazy with gall sickness. But I can't exclude it. I don't know if she's had that. Um, but she might have aborted as well if she had the gall sickness. So we need to go from the beginning through to the end. What um, Was she the only one doing this? Um, was there any dietary changes? Did she get hurt? Does she have internal parasites? Does she have a tick in her ear? Because usually if they're circling to the one side, it means there's a lesion on the side that they're circling to. So um, it could be a worm in her brain. So I can give you a whole list of things that it could be, but we need to work through systemically. Um, or systematically and then see what we end up with. But just telling me that she's circling, I can give you a hundred things, but if you give me more information, that's why this list of things to go through is so important. And if you can take videos, I mean, these days with cell phones, we can take videos, we can take photos and you can give that information to your vet. Did she get better after carving or did she die with the carving um, that is in Piwe? No, she did not die. She's still looking, looking healthy. It's just that uh, the turning around not, not at all. She's still the same. Stopped. Okay. Yeah, I okay, yeah, so I went I would... to the vet. Yeah, I did go to the vet. Uh, he gave me some medication. It did not help. It did not help. What medicine did he give you? Can do you remember? Can't can't remember. Okay. Yeah. But, but it was um, a good what we can a combination. Okay. But it is an interesting case. What we can do is um, if you email me at info at afrivet.co.za, then we can chat about your case a bit more. Okay, so it's info at afrivet. So like Africa vet, afrivet.co.za. I'll put it in the chat. If you guys want to email us, then um, maybe someone type it now. If you have questions, you can send it there, info at afrivet.co.za. Because I know well, sometimes the lines are bad. Okay, thanks, Mtati Simpiwe, but it's an interesting case. Um, we'll think about that one. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, no, thank you, uh, and that is uh, Our next uh, will be Chofa Jo Matsimela. You can hopefully, yeah, Matsimela. Okay, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi there, Komoto and everyone. Hi, Didi. Um, I just wanted to, with the process um, of checking and observing your animals, so I try to um, sort of walk with the animals and spend time with them every day so that they kind of get used to me um, and used mm -hmm. to my presence and, and you know, being able to touch them. And so I try to push those limits every day um, so that the animals get used to me. But of mm -hmm. course, not all of the animals are as comfortable or warm up to you um, as quickly as others. So when you're conducting the observations, um, especially with the kind of more invasive ones, like looking under the tail and mm. such, like the mm. adder and the testes, how do you sort of get close enough um, or, or like being able okay. to lift okay. the tail without stressing them out? Because I, I know like um, I could put them through the crush. Um, we're trying to do that now also. Um, we've started putting them through the the crush every day so that they kind of just get used to the idea of mm. going through that um but I, I don't think uh we can necessarily do that and check them individually every single day under the tail um so how do i get close enough i guess um to be able to observe um, each one the way that they need to yeah thank mm. you so that's a very very good question and i think what you're doing is awesome how many cattle mm. do you have in the group um we right now we have one bull and then we have about 15 um, mature cows okay so it's possible it won't like, also we have to be practical about things if someone has twenty thousand sheep it's a bit complicated to grab everyone and look at them but with mm -hmm. um i think what you are doing is good because you need to make them sort of get to know you and it does take time i mean it's like potty training a puppy they don't learn in two days, some do, but they are the exception to the rule. And there are specific ways that you can approach cattle. Remember, cattle are prey animals, so they are being eaten and they see us as prey if they don't know us. And there are certain mm. um, sort of ways that you approach cattle to make them more at ease. So you don't approach them from behind, they freak out, they have a blind spot. So if you can, and then I know people always want to rub a cow's nose. I don't know why we want to do that, but that's very bad. <laughs> you don't start that way because this is aggressive. If you see cattle fighting, the nose is quite an yeah. aggressive spot. Mm -hmm. It's like punching them in the face and like, and we go and we're like, oh, yeah, Bessie, my cow, and you punch <laughs> in the face. That's like what a big signal. So I think what you're doing of getting them to move through the crash and um, making them say that's a good idea. And just be patient because there's not a um, a quick way to fix it. And um, and with the a number of animals you have, I think you will actually manage to get it right. And then start with your calves to get used to you because they will then grow up knowing you. And then with new sure. animals we get in, obviously it's a feat in itself. But just continue what you're doing. Try to approach them from the front and body language. So you don't go like this and look them in the eye. You approach them sideways because it's way less aggressive oh. and you um, sort of go where they can see you. So sort of this angle, if I was your cow, don't approach me from anything other than that. That oh, they see, oh yeah, Tsekhofatsu is visiting me again today. And if you can add food to the mix, even if you give them carrots or whatever, just that you show them I'm calm, I'm nurturing. And obviously cattle are dangerous. And even if, especially when they tame, because we sort of mm. feel calm, we're not as observant. So always have that mutual respect going that you don't get injured. Um, but if you can push them through the crush that they get used to that. Um, and you will see, you'll get to know it. So you don't have to go lift up the tail every day, just um, if it's not possible. But if you at least once a week can look for ticks, remember tick in inspections is once a week. So if you can once a week have the 15 animals in the crush, that you can just check under the tail, check the other in that one. But the head, um, I don't know if you remember, we said 50% is sort of temperament. If an animal is, um, if you can just at least see the head and their demeanor, you already see most of your symptoms there, if the animal's okay or not okay. Um, but yeah, continue what you're doing. I think you're doing a great job, Tsekhofatso. So um, 
yeah, continue what you're doing. And then if you can get them into the crush at least once a week to um, just get them used to the tail looking, then that's already way more than what most people are doing and you will pick up. And, mm -hmm. and the more time they get, the more you'll be able to assess them. So mm -hmm. no, well done, really well done. Yeah, All you're right. doing Thank a good so job, much, Fighter. Keep up the good work Thank and don't use the stick to move them. Use the stick just to guide them <laughs> when they go to the Never, never. <laughs> I'm a lover no, of no. the animals. So, All right, <laughs> no, that's you. good to hear and that that so in my has been practiced. Yeah. And advice I once got as well, you'll see that people are really good with um, livestock. They have this very low whistle that they do. I struggle. Mm. I, I can't whistle like that, but the, it's a, <laughs> a like a low whistle. And the animals are calm. You see when those um, assistants come and they help us when we're trying to do PDs, et cetera, yes. um, when they whistle, those, the cattle calm down. So if you can learn the low whistle, um, I'm not going to try and do it <laughs> on a webinar. Um, but you'll see, especially the older gentlemen, they're so good with the cattle. Um, they have this low, low whistle that they do, and it just calms them down so nicely so that they get used to your whistle. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also an idea. Oh, that's good to hear. Okay, any other question? Seems like uh, that doesn't appear you still have another question because I can see your, your hand is still on. That there's the thing where and I are going to email each other. So, okay, <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah, all right. Then, in awesome. absence of questions, I think we can end our session here and uh. Oh, okay. This is the last question that you are taking. Manu Komoja, you are the last person to ship in. Okay. Ndatenoko, Manuko, you can unmute yourself. Okay, maybe it, it was a mistake. The last one is Tabo Charles. You are the last one. <laughs> Hey, how oh, morning, morning, everyone. Yeah, good and south. Morning, Tabo. Morning, morning. When is the next section? Oh, okay. The next section will be next month in around towards the end of the month of November. So uh, based on the topic, I'm not sure because the topics that we deliver is based on your request. So if you saw when you were registering in the link, there was a platform to say which topic of interest you would like us to present. So that's where we're giving you the flexibility for you to say whatever information that you want to reserve. And uh, through our stakeholders, then we can deliver that. Okay. So just keep your eye on our LinkedIn media, actually social media platform that you'll get more details. No problem. All right. Well, Thank you. Sorry, I said it's the 23rd of November. Yes, 23rd of November. Okay. So, okay. all right. I guess uh, in, if there is any question, you can either email Dr. Didi or email myself. Then uh, we can take your, your questions further. And at the same time, just know that this session was recorded and will be put on Red Meat Kuluma on YouTube channel. So if you missed this session or maybe you still want to review something, then you can just go to Red Meat Kuluma where you can get all the previous sessions, including this one that uh, will be uploaded. So yeah, in the absence of questions, thank you so much, Didi, for your participation thank and you, making bro. time. <laughs> To be here no, I know it was not easy <laughs> no it's awesome it's really awesome to chat to people who want to uh, farm and farm well so if you guys remember one thing get a vet and buy security buy security buy security buy security okay. buy security awesome. buy security okay no thank you <laughs> so much guys. Thank you. As Aramited, we ensure that we have a vision to say we foster stakeholder engagement in the red meat industry towards inclusive growth through knowledge transfer. So keep in touch with us, then you're going to bring more sessions like this. Thank you so much.